Let us worship together. We have moved the lighting of the Advent wreath until right before the children's sermon so that they can come up and see that a little bit closer. And so with that, we will move right into our confession. Family of faith, one of the ways we find joy in a weary world is through connection. The prayer of confession is a place of connection with God. In the prayer of confession, we get to come before God with our full, messy, honest selves. And in the midst of that mess, God tells us that we are loved claimed, and forgiven. There is no greater joy than that. So join me in this prayer of confession, not because you have to, but because you can. Let us connect with our merciful God. God of laughter, God of open doors, and of family reunions, we confess that we often doubt good news. We move through this world waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for life to fall apart, waiting for our humanity to get the best of us. Instead of leaning into joy, we lean into scarcity. We lean into fear, we lean into isolation. Forgive us for forgetting that joy is amplified when shared. Heal the wounds we have from past hurts and tell us to throw open our doors like Elizabeth. Show us how to find joy in connection. Amen. Faith family, we do not need to fear God when we are honest with the struggles of our lives. God meets us with grace and hospitality. There is laughter, there is joy, there is grace, and it is holy. So trust this. Believe this. You are claimed, you are loved, you are forgiven, and you are sent to serve. Amen. Our opening hymn today is a familiar one for many of us. It's from Holden Evening Prayer. And so um, we have some, a duet coming up to sing the opening part for us, and then we will join together with them.
just kind of feels like we should clap after every song today, doesn't it? Wow, thank you. Please pray with me the prayer of the day. Holy God, we know that you are near. We know that you are inviting us into your, into your word, into relationship, and into deeper joy. So as we approach your word, O oh God, we pray, do not allow distraction or doubt to get the best of us. Do not, do not let us walk down this road without you. Instead, give us the wisdom to turn and run your way. Give us the openness to hear your wisdom and be changed by it. With hope and gratitude, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children to come up as we light the Advent wreath. Come on up, and you can come right here in front, and then we'll, we'll sit down for the children's sermon, but you can come right up here front so you can see. We light the Advent, every, the Advent wreath every week as we get closer to Christmas. Last week we lit this candle. This week we're going to light this one. I told Judy I'd have a lighter for her, which then I didn't do. Um, so as we get closer to Christmas, we keep lighting these candles until we light the last one in the center. And we'll have a call and response with the congregation just like before. So how does a weary world practice peace? By advocating for justice and caring for our neighbor, by participating Sabbath and forgiving 70 times 7. There are a million ways to practice peace. So today we light the candle of peace as a reminder and a charge. Amen. This one's tricky to light. I struggled this morning, too. There you go. All right. Thank you, Judy, for helping us do that. All right. And now, kids, we'll have the children's sermon right here today. So um, I want us to try something today. I'm going to ask someone from the congregation to tell us something that's really exciting happening in their lives, and I want you to stay completely silent and don't smile, just listen. Can you do that? No smiling, completely silent. Who has something exciting to share with us? Something good happening in your life. It can be anything. Yes? Good job, everybody. What else? Anybody else have something exciting to share? Why wouldn't they want to share exciting things with us right now, do you think? They don't like things. They don't like things? <laughs> Maybe they don't have very many exciting things happening. Why else wouldn't they want to tell us things right now about something exciting happening in their life? Why? Yeah, because it's not very much fun to tell you something exciting happening in your life when the people you're telling it to are just silent and it seems like they don't even care. So this time, when we ask people to share something exciting, we're going to cheer and be excited with them. Okay, are you ready? Joanne, what are you doing? <laughs> happening with Janine? Drew, tell us again. Janine gets to go to a condo in Maui. Who else has something exciting to tell us? What else is happening in your lives? Oh, puppies. Okay, we have to follow up with that one, though. Are you bringing one home? Oh, oh. Look at how many 
tree, like how many scarves and hats and socks are on this tree. This is all people who get to be warm this winter. Yay! So today you're going to hear in the story in the gospel about a woman who has some really exciting news, but she hasn't even said anything for five months until her friend comes and then they get to celebrate together. And it she hasn't, she hasn't really told anyone what's going on. And so uh, we're going to talk about how in community, like we, all he- we are here, that when we share our joy, it gets multiplied. So this holiday season, as people tell you something that's exciting, it might feel a little goofy to get really excited with them, but one of the greatest gifts we can give people is to be excited when they're excited. So I encourage you to also do that with the people in your lives. All right, shall we say a prayer before I send you back to your seats? Please pray with me. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for friends. Thank you for family. Thank you for joy. Amen. All right, and now this is the worst part of the month for Eric. There's no Sunday school today. You can go back to your seats with your parents. Thank you for coming up. And we'll continue our worship service with our readings. Our scripture reading today is from Isaiah Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, 1 uh, 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A a voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And a voice cries out, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All the people are grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judea, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them into his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. may be seated to enjoy the reading of the gospel. As a reminder of what happened last week, Elizabeth and Zachariah were told that they were going to have a baby, and Zachariah didn't believe it was possible. So because of that, the angel told him that he would be unable to speak until the baby was born. And you'll also, we'll be hearing about Mary today, and Mary and Elizabeth are related. So we have a family connection there in the story as well. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, 
Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and it is the sixth month of her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believes that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Zachariah has been silent for five months. What's the longest you have been silent for? Five minutes, okay? 30 minutes? Maybe, maybe like 12 hours, but while you're asleep? Yeah. And a lot of times, Eric, how long have you been silent for? Around one minute. Parents are nodding, yes, yes. Um, a lot of times when we're choosing silence, it's because it's something that we have control over. Occasionally we'll lose our voice because of sickness or something, but often it's because we're choosing it. But Zachariah is not choosing this. He is silent. Now, when I was in seminary, I was intrigued by the idea of silent retreats, what it might look like to spend time truly being silent and listening to God. And so I developed a silent retreat that I could use, and it was, it was all based around nature, and it was really nice. I'm here to tell you that if you're going to dabble in silent retreats, maybe start with like an hour, maybe two hours, not a 48-hour long silent retreat. Uh, it, got, it was long, and it was something I chose to do. I can't imagine five months. But the other thing about this text that we see is that Elizabeth has also been secluded for five months. So let's think about Elizabeth, where she is, the, the culture and the context that she's in. Um, why would Elizabeth be secluded as well as Zachariah not being able to speak? What are your guesses? Why is Elizabeth secluded? What do you think? She's doubtful that she really is pregnant. Oh, Elizabeth, can you imagine her? She does not think pregnancy is even a possibility for her. And then it's months, right, before she starts showing before she starts feeling a baby move, and maybe she has pregnancy symptoms, but it's hard to convince herself that this is really happening. She can't go to the doctor and get an ultrasound. So maybe she's doubting. Maybe it's just easier to stay hidden away until she's sure. Why else might Elizabeth be secluded? She didn't think people would believe her. Now let's think about the context of this. Who is the best person to back her up on this story? 
her husband who is silent. So if she goes out in public and she says this is happening, there's no one to back her up. And what happens to Elizabeth if people think she had an affair? She'll get stoned. And they have been married for a very long time. And it is believed that she is barren. So if there's a hint of adultery, her life could be in danger. And her husband can't even speak up to protect her. Any other reasons that Mary might be secluded at this point? For her own safety, for the safety of her husband, for, um, you know, the onslaught of colds and flus and anything that might hurt the pregnancy. And there's another reason why she might not tell anyone. In addition to not believing fully that she could be pregnant, what would be the worst thing to happen? She could lose the baby. So, Elizabeth is secluded. And as we look at all of these potential reasons for why she is secluded, we can see that it all comes back to this place of fear. She's scared to tell people because she's scared that maybe it's not real. She's scared to tell people because she's afraid she might lose the baby. She's secluded because she's scared of what going into public might mean. She's secluded because there's no one to back up her story and she's afraid she won't be believed. And because of this fear, she just goes home and waits and prays. And her husband, sitting in his own fears, can't even comfort her with words. And then Mary gets incredible news. And Mary's told that she is going to get pregnant as well. She is going to um, bear the Son of God, some pretty miraculous things. And almost word for word, Mary says what Zachariah said. How? How? How can this be? But Zechariah says it from a place of disbelief. This cannot be. And Mary says it from a place of wonder and then just some logistical questions. But how can this be? But they have very different, while they're using the same words, they have a very different response to what God is doing. And then Mary goes to see Elizabeth because she wants to share the news of her pregnancy. She wants to share the news of what this angel said. And is there a safer person to go tell this to than another woman who has also been visited by a miracle, whose husband had an angel come to him, and now they're sharing this incredible experience together? And in the midst of Elizabeth's fears, the baby leaps in her womb. It is undeniable. This is not a phantom movement. This is her son who will be John the Baptist, who will make the way for Jesus. And the baby's rejoicing. When we share with each other our joys, our joy gets to be multiplied. And we all get to celebrate together in the children's message. We felt it in the room even. Some of you wanted to rejoice with one another, but per instructions, you were holding back. And it felt bad because we want to celebrate with one another. Why don't we want to share our weariness with one another? Joy is fun to share. And we know that it will be multiplied when we do that as we celebrate together. But why don't we want to share our weariness with one another? What holds us back from that? We don't want to bring someone else down. Yeah, we can just hold it ourselves. That's fine. Hate to bur hey, we don't want to burden someone else. We don't want to bring them down. What else? Oh, it shows weakness, and we don't want other people to see that weakness. We would love to think that we could just do it on our own, right? Oh. Yeah, you, 
You feel ashamed and you don't want to tell someone else that you're feeling ashamed, even though shame is one of those emotions that isolates us from others. And connection is how we get past that. When we share joy, it's multiplied. But when we share weariness, we help each other carry it. It's not like joy where when I share it with you, you get to experience it as well. When I share my weariness with you, the weariness is still the same amount of weariness, but now there's two of us carrying it. As a congregation, when we share where we are weary with one another, as a community of believers, we then begin to carry that weariness with one another. We have members of this congregation who are weary this season. They're dealing with grief, <clears throat> with chronic pain, with not knowing what's next. And those things are not multiplied when shared. But it does become easier to carry when there's more of us doing the work. And God has made us to be in these connections with one another. Our lives do not come easier when we allow fear to break the connection with people around us. Our lives become better when we can connect with people and share ourselves fully and authentically with those around us. When I worked at Warper College, I had students come in all the time, and they didn't want to tell me what was going on in their life because they said, it just feels too heavy to give to someone else. It never feels as heavy for us to help carry your weariness as it does to you but it can certainly help you when we carry some of it. So what does it take for us to live this way? In a way that allows us to share both joy and struggle. First of all, it, it takes an incredible amount of bravery to say, I can't do this on my own, or I don't want to do this on my own anymore. It takes bravery to say, I am having a hard time. But you were never designed to do it on your own. You were designed to come to places like this, surrounded by people who know the love of God, who can say, we're in this together as a community. So here's my prayer for you. This week, this month of Advent, my prayer for you is that you would be brave and you would share with those around you where your struggles are and that you would be generous with your joy so that others can celebrate with you because elizabeth should have been celebrating her joy that whole time and there were people ready to do that mary rushed to her side to share in their mutual joy so people of God, be brave, connect, reach out, and know that not only is there this community of faith ready to help you carry your weariness and rejoice with you, but there is a God who loves you, who is carrying the weariness with you and loves you. Amen. Um, we'll continue with our hymn of the day, Blessed Be the God of Israel. And if we would like to share in some joy of this song, this is Charmaine's favorite song. And she has been asking me when we're going to sing it. So please rise as you are able and join Charmaine in her joy of singing Blessed Be the God of Israel. She did not want to do that. <laughs>
we now say together our affirmation of faith. We believe that joy is a sacred gift stemming from the truth that we belong to God. We believe that joy is not meant for isolation. Joy is meant to be shared, weaving us together in laughter and in hope. And when joy feels impossibly out of reach, we believe that part of community is leaning on one another. So together we say, I will share my joy when yours runs out. You will share your joy. And in doing so, we'll see God. Amen. We join together with the prayers of intercession responding to God of mercy with hear our prayer. God of today and God of tomorrow, we come to you this morning to thank you for the way that joy binds us together. Thank you for contagious laughter, for inside jokes, for stories around dinner tables that make us laugh until we cry. God of mercy. Thank you for comedy shows, for the familiar sound of a loved one's chuckle, and for smile lines. What a gift you have given us. Our text today reminds us that joy is better when shared, so today we thank you in particular for the people in our lives that we get to rejoice with and who generously share their joy. God of mercy. Thank you for the people who spark joy in us. Thank you for the people who pull us out of our shells, who teach us how to dance and show us how to laugh. Thank you for those who declare, blessed are you, God of mercy. Holy God, although we know that joy is better when shared, there are days when that is easier said than done. Like Elizabeth, who stayed in isolation for months after receiving her good news, we too have a tendency to choose fear over joy. Without the help of someone at our door, we can often keep to ourselves. Help us to share this joy even when it's hard. God of mercy. So gracious God, with those days come, so gracious God, when those days come, when the waters of fear rise, when isolation steals our joy, comfort us. Comfort us like a shepherd with their flock. Gather us into your arms and carry us to safer ground that we might experience joy in the ways you have in store for us. And until that promised day, like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to keep finding one another. Like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to open the door to one another, to you, and to the joy that connection brings. We, have, we pray especially for members of our community who are seeking community and for those in need of comfort. And we pray for this congregation as we prepare for our annual meeting that you would speak louder than any fears that we have and lead us with joy into this next year. God of mercy. Loving God, we lift all of these prayers, spoken and those unspoken that are on our hearts, trusting and knowing that you listen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share a sign of peace with one another.
please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we thank you for these gifts that you have given to us and that we gratefully return to you. Guide us to see where the need is greatest in our community and in the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you also made all things new. In the day when he comes again to be in the world, we sing with the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and a host of heavens, and we praise God's name. Remembering that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them to eat, saying, Take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after he gave thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered together in the name of Jesus, we pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. As you come forward for communion today, everyone is welcome. We have gluten-free bread available, and then there's wine in the middle of the tray and grape juice along the outside of it. We commune continually, which means just fill in along the railing, and you can stand or kneel, whatever is most comfortable for you. We also have prepackaged elements as well if you prefer those. Those are not gluten-free. We also have some members of the congregation who have requested to have a special blessing said for them as they come up for communion. If you would like to have a special blessing said before you receive the bread, you can simply tell me verbally, I would like a blessing today, and I would be happy to provide one. Please come. Everything is ready.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you today and every day. Amen. We won't have too many announcements today because we'll have the annual meeting and so many announcements will be made during that, ta that time, but a few quick reminders for you. If you're bringing cookies for the Christmas program, bring them next Sunday or Monday the 11th in the morning so we can get those plated. We could use maybe a dozen or two more, so if you're someone who's already volunteered to bring some but can bring two instead, let me know. And if you're dying to make some Christmas cookies, we'll take them. So just let me know if you have some extras in your house, and we will gladly serve those to the preschool parents as they come for the program on the 11th. We have the nativity. Um, do you want to talk about it a little bit, Katie? She's not miked, but... <laughs> yes, Jamie's running. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> Next Saturday, we're carpooling up to the Bellevue Festival of the Nativity. I've had about four people offer to be drivers for us, so we should have seat belts for those, but it's a family-friendly, all-age, wonderful event, hundreds and hundreds of nativity scenes that you just walk through. There's a lot of um, programming with musical performances while we're there. So we'll be leaving the parking lot around 1 p.m., carpooling up there, seeing what we can see, coming back to the church around 3 for some coffee and cookies, not coffee, probably cocoa and cookies, and um, conversation just about what we saw and what we experienced. So it would be a very meaningful thing for a field trip. Come with us. Let me know. Bye. Wonderful. If you are someone who took one of the names off the giving tree to get the gift certificate, those are due back today. You can see Linda and uh, get her that back so that we can get those out to the families who are in need so they have time to get gifts for children. What else? Okay. Now, I want to be clear about these instructions that are about to come next. We are going to sing our last, we're going to have the benediction, sing our last song, and then have a sending. And there is some food, as I can smell it, uh, that Janine has made, and so we'll have some food. But we want people, I'm looking at Leif right now, because, like, 1045. 10.45. So grab some food, eat, don't leave. That's the most important instruction. Stay, and we'll have our annual meeting, and that is important work of the church as we talk about things that are business, but also we talk about what God is calling us to in this next year. We also have a lot to rejoice this year, so we give thanks for that. So with that, I ask that you rise for the benediction, and then we'll sing our closing hymn. Receive the benediction. As you leave this place, you go into a weary world, so speak tenderly. Do that good that is yours to do. Choose connection, hold on to hope, and remember that Christ took on flesh for you. You are God's beloved, so go rejoicing. The world needs it. Amen.
in peace, God is with you.